Hi guys, Olive here, here today to recommend eight fantastic books that all feature nature writing. Longtime viewers of this channel will probably know about my dedication to nature writing. I just love reading about animals and plants and the experience of being out in nature. Some of my all-time favorite books are nestled within this subgenre, and so I thought in this video I would recommend a few gems, books that not only feature nature writing, but that I think are just downright fantastic. I have whittled this list down to six nonfiction books and two fiction books. I had to be extremely selective or else we would be here all day. I read a lot of books that feature nature writing. I've also made the choice to leave off three of my all-time favorite books, Ages for Hawk, Lab Girl, and The Soul of an Octopus. I feel like my love for those books is well known. I don't want to just be repeating the same books over and over, and I did want a chance to highlight some books that are at least slightly less popular. But since I've taken three of my all-time favorite memoirs that feature nature writing completely out of the mix, let me start off this list by talking about one that I really enjoyed, but that I talk about far less frequently than those three. That book is The Outrun by Amy Liptrot. This is, as I said, a memoir of the author's upbringing on and then return to Orkney, which is an archipelago of islands off of Scotland's northeastern coast. Orkney is a rather inhospitable place. The weather is extreme, it is cold, it is windy, and it tends to beat a hardiness into its residents. The author of this book bolted from Orkney the moment that she could as a teenager to move to London. But when her fast-paced party lifestyle morphed into a serious drinking problem, she returns home to Orkney after a stint in rehab to find herself again. She finds much of herself back home, as it turns out. She sees her own leanings toward the extremes of life reflected in the landscape, and as she connects more with the place that she grew up by doing polar bear dives and freezing cold water and participating in an ecological initiative, she finds peace. I read and reviewed this book during Nonfiction November 2017, and it has not left my mind since. I'll try not to gush too much about this next one, but no promises, because it's The Triumph of Seeds by Thor Hansen. My love for natural history writer Thor Hansen cannot be understated. I adored him from the first book I picked up of his, but this one is probably my favorite. This book is obviously a natural history of the seed, something simultaneously so humble and yet so vital for the existence of our society. To write this book, he consulted scientists of various kinds, farmers and historians, to present this account of how seeds evolved, how they work, and how much we depend upon them. This book contains one of my favorite descriptions of all time there is a section where Thor Hansen is talking to a scientist about what a seed is precisely and how it works. And the way she describes a seed is a baby in a box with its lunch. It is the cutest thing I have ever heard. Every single time I think about seeds or I'm looking at seeds, that line pops into my head and it's happening more frequently lately because I'm getting into gardening. This book and really all of Thor Hansen's books are equal parts fun and informative. You really can't go wrong when you pick one up. I hope that you'll appreciate my restraint in compiling this list of recommendations because I only allowed myself to select one bird book. The one that I chose is Saving Jemima by Julie Zickfuss. This is the story of how the author, who had had lots of wildlife rehabilitation experience, I should note, took in an orphaned baby blue jay and raised her. This little bird, who they named Jemima, of course, lived in their house for a substantial period of time. And considering that blue jays are corvids, which is the highly intelligent family of birds that contains crows, magpies, and ravens, it was quite the experience. Zigfus was going through a lot of personal issues around the time that Jemima entered her life. And so Julie finds a lot of purpose in caring for Jemima. She gets very attached to her. She spends a lot of time with her, getting to know her personality. She also spends a lot of time learning more about Blue Jays. The only way to really properly sum up this book is nourishing, spiritually nourishing. I gave this book a full review for Open Letters Review. If you'd like to hear me gush more about this book, I will link that down below for you. I just had to include Walden by Henry David Thoreau on this list because it's a nature writing classic. I know most American students are required to read at least a portion of this book in school, but in case you haven't heard of it, this is Henry David Thoreau's account of spending two years of his life 
living simply in nature, and what all that experience taught him about life. There are some really beautiful passages in here. I actually read some of my favorites in a video I did on this channel a while back. I will link that for you if you'd like to hear some of those. But this is a classic that I think is infinitely worth spending some time with. And speaking of seclusion, another one I highly recommend is The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating by Elizabeth Tova Bailey, which was written by a woman who was hit with a mystery illness when she was previously in perfect health, and she was bedridden for an extended period of time. During this period of time, she spent a lot of her time alone, and she was cut off from the active lifestyle that she had previously enjoyed. It was a heartbreaking, soul-crushing time in her life. But her spirits were ever so slightly lifted when she gained a tiny friend. The author's friends had brought her a tiny little snail to keep her company, and in the following months, the snail provided not just companionship, but also entertainment when the author would just watch the snail for hours on end when she physically wasn't able to do much else. This book also provides a lot of scientific information about snails that the author went on to research after her return to health. This is a delight of a little book that has the power to lift your spirits in the same way that the snail lifted the author's. The last nonfiction book I'd like to recommend in this video is In Search of the Canary Tree by Lauren E. Oakes. The canary tree in the title is actually the yellow cedar tree, which is native to Alaska. It's called the canary tree as an allusion to the canary in the coal mine, meaning that the decline of this tree is also a warning about climate change. To sum up the science, very simply, very briefly, the roots of this tree are particularly delicate. They are very susceptible to the cold. And with the reduction of snowfall in Alaska, largely because of climate change, the roots lose that insulating layer of snow that protects them from the cold. The author of this book traveled to this region of Alaska to study this tree as part of her PhD program to collect data on the trees themselves, but also to speak to the residents of the area. These trees are highly important to this region in a myriad of ways. And with their loss looming, it really shines a light on how much humans depend upon nature and what that relationship is going to look like as temperatures continue to rise. This is obviously a very powerful tale. It's very atmospheric. You can feel Alaska all around you. This is another one I wrote about for Open Letters Review, so I will link my review down below if you'd like to learn more. And then finally, I wanted to briefly mention two works of fiction that feature nature writing. I know when we think about nature books, we first think about nonfiction, but fiction has a seat at the table as well. First, I'd like to quickly mention one that I just recently reviewed, that is The Signature of All Things by Elizabeth Gilbert. The main character of this big work of historical fiction is a botanist, and while she appreciates all different types of plants, her specialty is mosses. The way she talks about moss, the way she talks about plants, and the natural world in general is so beautiful, it'll make you appreciate it right alongside of her. This book quickly became a new favorite of mine. If you'd like to hear more about it, I will link my review for you down below. And then finally, All Among the Barley by Melissa Harrison also features a great deal of nature writing, although it's much more autumnal in its feel. This is a coming-of-age tale set in the English countryside in the early 1930s. We follow a young girl named Edie who lives and works on her family's farm, where they primarily grow cereal grains. Edie has never really been away from the countryside. It's all she's ever known and her family depends so heavily upon the land to provide them with a living, and the farm is not doing all that well. So Edie has a really interesting connection to and relationship with the land that her family lives on. Melissa Harrison writes about all of this so gorgeously in the book, and like any really great nature writing does, she makes the surroundings as much of a character as any of the people. This is a really great one to pick up around harvest time. So those were eight books either about nature or that feature nature in a big way. I loved each and every one of the books on this list, and I hope you do too if you decide to pick them up. If you're interested in reading any of them, or if you've read any of them already, please do let me know in the the comment section below. And if you'd like to connect with me somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media, and the links to all of my profiles will be in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye! Bye.